another 7, 8, 8 here. Great action figure. So great. Top tier. Love G.I. Joe. Ready, silence, kill. Hello everybody, Huda Kubrick Matter 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review, and this one is special. We've done a few patrons choice reviews on this channel, and those are a lot of fun. All of my patrons get to vote on what we review on this channel, but that got me thinking. There are some patrons who vote for what they want to see, but that figure or vehicle doesn't win. And so this video is for those guys. Not long ago, we did a patron's choice poll in which the results were very close between Crystal Ball and Jinx. And Crystal Ball won, but a lot of people voted for Jinx. So this time, we're going to look at Jinx. Hello? Can anyone hear me? This is Anubis2814. Brian? Brian Tulsa, please respond. What the hell's happening here? I think I found him. Brian Tulsa, please confirm your dimensional coordinates. Sorry folks, working with old equipment here. Let me just tighten the transmitter band and that should eliminate the interference. No, no, wait. That's better. For all the patrons out there that voted but didn't win, HCC 788 presents Jinx. This is Jinx, G.I. Joe's ninja slash intelligence agent from 1987. This figure was available in 1987 and 1988. It was discontinued for retail in 1989, but it was available as a mail away offer that year. There were no other versions of Jinx in the vintage line. Jinx was our female figure for 1987. Up to that point, we had a new female figure each year. In 1982, we had Scarlet. In 1983, we had CoverGirl. In 1984, we got the Baroness. In 1985, there was Lady J. And in 1986, we got Zorana. And then, of course, in 1987, Jinx. There was no new female figure in 1988, nor in 1989, or 1990. In fact, there were no new female G.I. Joe figures until 1993, with version 2 of Scarlet. And no, I am not counting the Street Fighter series, sorry. That is expected from a toy line marketed toward boys, but the loss of women characters causes the line to lose a dimension. Action figures of women didn't sell as well as figures of men, but in the early years, Hasbro would still give us one woman figure out of 15 to 20 men. Sure, it was tokenism, but without the one figure, you don't even have the token. A jinx is a person who brings bad luck. In the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie, she was referred to as being unlucky or bringing bad luck, so that fits her name. She is a ninja, and she is in the direct lineage of another G.I. Joe-related ninja, Storm Shadow. Storm Shadow started out as a villain, a Cobra ninja, in 1984. In 1988, a second version of Storm Shadow was released, and by then he had switched sides and was working with G.I. Joe. Storm Shadow's switch to the good side was engineered by Larry Hama, the primary writer of the G.I. Joe comic book and the file cards for the figures, who was himself a Japanese American. I'll go into more detail on that the next time I review a Storm Shadow figure. Her file card has her name as Top Secret. However, depending on whether you believe her media appearances or modern versions of her file card, her name is Kimi or Kim Arashikage. Arashikage is a combination of Japanese words, with Arashi meaning storm and Kage meaning shadow. It translates literally to storm. Shadow. The comic book revealed a lot more about her background, but we'll get to that later. Let's take a look at Jinx's accessories, starting with what the contents of her card refer to as her ninja toe. There are two of them in silver plastic. Ninja toe is a ninja sword. These swords have a slightly curved blade, and ninja toe were usually straight. Uh, the ninja toe also tended to have square guards. The guards on these swords are rounded at the edges. The size is right. 
great, though. They tended to be shorter than the wakizashi, the long samurai sword we often see movie ninjas carrying. The ninja toe is not a traditional weapon. It is a 20th century invention. Both of these swords can slot into her backpack. There are two slots, one for each, and they both fit in pretty well. These swords should not be confused with Quick Kick's sword. They are the same color, but his sword is longer and has less detail on the handle wrapping. Let's move on to her next accessory. We have what the contents of the card refer to as a naginata. It is in silver plastic. Uh, it is a staff with jagged, multi-pointed blades on each end, uh, and there are two grips on the staff. They're almost right. A naginata is a Japanese staff weapon with a blade on the end, usually on one end. If any examples of a double-bladed naginata exist, I haven't found it. This weapon is designed like a pugil stick, which is a padded stick used to train soldiers in rifle and bayonet combat. However, instead of padding, this stick has blades at both ends. Jinx is seen training with a pugil stick in the 1987 animated movie. The problem with having blades on both ends is, to strike the enemy with one end leaves the other blade pointed at you. There's a high potential for self-injury. Her final accessory is her backpack, and the backpack is black. It looks like a parcel tied together with rope. It has four ninja stars sculpted on it, but the most important feature on this backpack is the storage for the swords. Storage for weapons is a bonus, and we didn't get enough of it on vintage figures. I want a figure to be able to carry all of its accessories all of the time. The only downside to this backpack is there is no place to put the Naginata staff when the swords are in use. You can wedge the Naginata between the backpack and the figure, and that kind of works, but it's not designed for that purpose. It doesn't stay well and it'll fall out. What would have been better is a clip on the backpack, like the one on Alpine's that holds his pickaxe. Well, let's take a look at the articulation for Jinx. She had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures from 1987, meaning her neck was on a ball joint so she could turn her head from side to side and look up and down. She could swing her arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. She had a hinge at the elbow that allowed her to move her arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. She had a swivel at the bicep that allowed her to swivel her arm all the way around. The figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed her to move at the torso a bit. She could move her legs apart about so far. She could move her leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. What? Ah! Hey, guys! I found him! I... Uh, wow! I... Wow! I... I found him! How did you... How did you get where you are? I, I mean, we've been looking for you for a long time, man. This is obviously leftover footage from Cobra Convergence. I'll tighten the restraining bolt so it doesn't play back the whole message. Dimension 788! That's... That, that's... That's what I said! I tried to convince them, but they wouldn't listen to me. But I found him! A lot of technical difficulties with this video. Sorry, folks. Let's take a look at the sculpt, design, and color of Jinx. And as it's easy to see, she is primarily red. There is a reason for that, and we'll talk about that later. On her head, she has a loose-fitting balaclava mask, which is associated with ninjas. We can only see her eyes. This figure was sculpted by Bill Merkline. There is a Q&A with Bill Merkline on YouTube in which he talks about his experiences working for Hasbro and sculpting G.I. Joe figures. He addresses Jinx specifically. He felt it was a mistake to make a good guy with a mask. In his mind, the villains wear masks and the heroes show their faces. I tend to agree, but there can be some exceptions. In the case of Jinx, the mask is a little frustrating. In her media appearances, she usually did not wear the mask. Kids could not reproduce those scenes or follow those play patterns with this figure. On her chest, she has a loose-fitting red top with 
a black collar, and she has a black dragon tampo on the left side of her chest. On her arms, she has loose-fitting red sleeves with black cuffs, and on her hands, she has fingernail polish. To my knowledge, this is the only G.I. Joe figure with painted fingernails. It looks kind of funny on the figure because the fingers aren't well differentiated. She has the usual C-shaped hands like all G.I. Joe figures so she could hold her accessories, uh, but the fingernail polish looks a little bit like red dots painted on the ends of oven mitts. We didn't have any other figures with fingernail polish, but we did have other women G.I. Joe figures with lipstick. Effort Efforts were made to make the figures look more feminine, and they needed the help because the sculpting wasn't always up to par. For Jinx, they avoided the problem of having a female figure with a masculine face sculpt by putting her behind a mask. On her waist, she has a black belt tied in the front, and she has a smaller waist than what was given to male G.I. Joe figures. This was another effort to give the figure a more feminine shape. Now, I don't think it worked well, though. The the problem is the articulation breaks up the sculpting too much, so it's a trade-off. Articulation versus a shapely female figure. With this figure type, you really just couldn't have both. On her waist, we have loose-fitting red trousers with black cuffs at the ankles and red shoes. At least she is wearing shoes, unlike Quick Kick, who chose to go barefoot. This also means she will get service at the 7-Eleven, whereas Quick Kick will not. Why is Jinx wearing red? Red has been associated with the Arashikage Ninja Clan since its introduction in the G.I. Joe comic book. When Storm Shadow first appeared in issue number 21, the famous silent issue, he was accompanied by ninjas in red. They continued to appear in the comic book series and were even included in the 2013 live action movie G.I. Joe Retaliation. Dimension 788 is locked on. Link established. Brian Tulsa, this is Puka. Listen carefully. Oh, no. Now I have a Puka in my system. You disappeared from our universe four years ago. We have been searching for you all that time. Using multimodal reflection sorting, we were able to trace you to Dimension 788. In a few minutes, we will be opening a dimensional portal so you can return. If you are being held against your will, we have commandos ready to rescue you. Please respond. When you have a puka in your system, there's only one thing you can do. I'm going to have to completely replace the interocitor. There we go. Brand new Interocitor from Radio Shack, and I think we're ready to go. Back to the review. Let's take a look at Jinx's file card. This file card was printed on the back of the card on which the figure was packaged. This file card is not perfect. It has a hole punched in it and looks like somebody cut a notch. Uh, to be honest, I forgot this file card was cut up like this and I did not have time to get a better one before this review. But my general rule on file cards is I just want them to be readable and this one is, so it's good enough. It has her faction as G.I. Joe and it has a portrait of Jinx here. It has her codename as Jinx and she is a ninja slash intelligence. So she is not just a ninja, she is also a spy. And I appreciate that they gave her an actual function on the team. Her file name is Top Secret. We have already talked about her real name. Her primary military specialty is intelligence. Her secondary military specialty is finance clerk. These file cards sometimes gave the characters mundane secondary specialties like finance clerk. In this case, she has the same secondary specialty as Alpine, who was also a finance clerk. Her birthplace is Los Angeles, California, the same birthplace as Quick Kick. I was born in East LA, man. Her pay grade is E5, so she is a sergeant. This paragraph says, Jinx studied and competed in three forms of martial arts from the time she was seven until she graduated from Bryn Mawr. She attended Bryn Mawr College, which is a prestigious women's college in Pennsylvania. Lady J also attended Bryn Mawr. I get the impression that Lady J is older than Jinx, so they were probably not there at the same time. Upon arriving in Japan, 
Japan for vacation, she discovered that her family had been ninjas for generations, and she was officially initiated into the clan. Jinx was recruited for the Joe team by Snake Eyes. There is no mention of the Arashikage clan by name. It does mention Snake Eyes, who was also a member of the Arashikage clan, although he was not a blood relation. Her ninja affiliation almost seems coincidental. She discovered it on vacation in Japan. In the comic book, it was central to her character. Jinx is ethnically Japanese and nationally American. This is another interesting parallel with Quick Kick, who was half Japanese and half Korean, but also an American from Los Angeles. This bottom paragraph has a quote. It says, Don't underestimate Jinx. She has been to the secret mountain and studied the seven silent forms with the Blind Master. And the Blind Master is a character from the comic book and another member of the Urashikage clan. She has the eye that pierces, the iron hand, and the heart that waits. She also has the nose that blows, the finger that points, and the butt that trumpets. She can see through your deception, batter aside your defenses, and dazzle you with the strength of her will. This card seems to say a lot about Jinx, but it actually leaves a lot unsaid, such as her relation to Storm Shadow and her history with the Urashikage clan. Both the comic book and the animated movie expand on the character. Here's an odd coincidence. In reading through Jinx's file card, I referenced three other file cards, all from 1985. Looking at how Jinx was portrayed in G.I. Joe Media, she did not appear in either the Sunbow animated series nor the Deke animated series. She did appear in the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie. In that movie, she was a new recruit, along with Chuckles, Tunnel Rat, Big Lob, Law, and Falcon. Unlike most of those other guys, she was a main character in the movie. She was the love interest for the main protagonist, Falcon. She had three important scenes in that movie. First, she trains with Beachhead, where it is revealed that she fights better when blindfolded. Second, she has a scene where Falcon slaps her on the ass, which is apparently something she was used to, because she didn't immediately spin around and ninja punch his testicles. In the final battle against Cobra Law, she uses her blind fighting technique to defeat Pythona. You probably already know that I dislike that movie, but Jinx was one of the better parts of it. She also mentions the Blind Master, who appeared in the comic book series. I think that makes the Blind Master canon in the animated continuity. Bonus! She later appeared in Valor vs. Venom, but that came after the vintage G.I. Joe run, so I don't normally look at those appearances. In the G.I. Joe comic book series by Marvel Comics, she first appears in issue number 59, in which she does not wear her red ninja costume. She wears a white gi and appears in the Blind Master's dojo. She confronts Billy, the son of Cobra Commander, who had been trained by Storm Shadow. Yeah, the ninja storyline in the comic books had become kind of convoluted at that point, but it was still pretty good. She appeared in issue number 85, a silent issue that was an homage to number 21. Although that silent issue is not as famous as the first one, it was still really well done. It is a masterpiece of sequential art. The story is told entirely without dialogue, but it is still very easy to follow and understand what's happening. In the comic book, she sometimes appeared in her red costume fighting red ninjas, such as in issue number 91. It's easy to spot the problem with this. It can be confusing. It's hard to tell who's who. In some panels, you have to look for the one with boobs. That's Jinx. She was appearing in the comic book clear into the 1990s, long after the Jinx action figure was discontinued. This is something I appreciate about the comic book. Of course it existed to sell toys, but it was more than just a toy catalog. There was no Jinx action figure to sell in 1994 when she appeared in issue number 145. But by then, she was an important part of the story, so she didn't just disappear. It was the same with a lot of other characters, too. This is something I'm not sure everyone at Hasbro understood. Selling G.I. Joe toys was not just about hawking plastic. It was about selling the fantasy. This is something Larry Hama understood. It was about creating a fantasy world with interesting characters the kids could relate to and exciting stories they could follow. That's what made kids want to buy the plastic. Even though the G.I. 
G.I. Joe Retaliation movie is well outside the vintage G.I. Joe run, it is worth mentioning here. There was a live action Jinx played by Elodie Young. She wears a version of her red costume in a training scene with Snake Eyes. In that scene, she trains blindfolded, which is a nice nod to the 1987 movie. The Blind Master also appears in that scene. Later, when she fights ninjas on a mountain with Snake Eyes, she does not wear her red costume. She wears a yellow suit. The reasons for this change are easy to understand. She needed to stand apart from the crowd of red ninjas. If she had worn red, she would have blended in and confused the action. It was a smart choice. The yellow is probably a nod to Bruce Lee's yellow suit in Game of Death. Warning. Interocitor breach. Unauthorized access to communications system. Ah, oh, there you are. Ah, oh, it's good to see you again, old friend. When you disappeared, we feared for the worst. I know, and I'm sorry, but I can't do this right now. I hacked into your interocitor to get your exact dimensional coordinates. We'll be opening a portal through the void to you in five minutes. Five minutes? That's probably enough time. I need to finish this, please. It's taking a lot of power to transmit through the barrier. Once we get the portal open, it'll be a lot easier to communicate. Just hang in there, mate. Jinx is a superb figure, and I consider it to be a top-tier figure. That may not be an obvious choice. She is wearing a bright color, her mask obscures her face even though she is unmasked in most of her media appearances, her accessories are okay but not great, and she has a touch of silliness with the painted fingernails. Despite that, there is a lot to love about this figure. The red makes sense in the context of the G.I. Joe universe. She is an Arashikage ninja. Of course she wears red. In fact, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes are oddballs for not wearing red. I often get irritated at bright colors on G.I. Joe figures, but in this case, there is a reason for it. The sculpting is well done. It's simple, it's elegant, and it does exactly what it needs to do. It's a female figure, which adds to the diversity of the G.I. Joe line, and it's the last female figure we got for several years. Despite being a woman in a toy line marketed toward boys, she is not sexualized. She's not wearing dominatrix gear like the Baroness. She's not wearing a form-fitting leotard like Scarlet. Her file card does not emphasize her looks like CoverGirl. She is a ninja and a spy and she's wearing a loose-fitting costume that is practical for fighting. Her accessories may not be perfect, but they're still pretty damn good. I'm particularly pleased about the weapons storage on the backpack. Love that. Wish we had more of that. Larry Hama loved him some ninjas, although the G.I. Joe storyline got a little too ninja-heavy in the later years. Jinx was a welcome addition to the lineup in 1987. Although we didn't get a new version of her for Ninja Force. Why no Jinx in Ninja Force? Missed opportunity there. We did it! The gateway's open. Come on, Brian, Tulsa, jump through! Guys, really, you didn't have to do this. How are you? How did you get there? What, what happened to you, man? Did they kidnap you? Anybody torture you? Did they touch you? Tell me, I won't tell anybody. No, honestly, I'm fine. But thanks for caring, Vogter. Where's all your Brian Tulsa stuff, and what's with the letters and numbers? You interrupted a video on my new channel. The viewers must be very confused by this. I should probably explain. Before this channel existed, I was known on YouTube as Brian Tulsa. I had a channel on which I talked about things that interested me, such as history, philosophy, law, and such. But I abandoned that channel during law school and walked away from YouTube, with no intention of ever coming back. A new YouTube channel? So, uh, what kind of video do you do? I do toy reviews. G.I. Joe toys, to be specific. Toys? No, sir! I didn't see you playing with your dolls again, sir! Alright, alright. Have your fun. I don't understand. On your old channel, you try to promote reason and critical thinking, not plastic figurines. And you were never mean-spirited or angry, except for that Brian Tulsa phase. That's what made you special. You were, uh, really boring. Thank you all for caring about me and wanting to make sure I'm okay, but... I chose to come here. 
You see, at the time I left the old channel, things were going very badly for me. I was having serious problems with family, friends, career, and school. I couldn't see any way out of the quagmire. Depression was getting the better of me. I couldn't see anything in the future but more darkness and pain. In desperation to find a little light in the world, I stopped looking at the future and I turned to the past. I found something that brought me joy in my childhood and I was able to recapture some of that joy. It brought me back to a time when life was full of hope and optimism. The things you see here may just look like plastic to you, but they saved me. Or at least they helped. They allowed me to feel some happiness again, which enabled me to accept the help of friends and family that cared about me. Now I try to spread that joy. These aren't just toys. For the people who played with them, they are connected to childhood memories, to friends, to families, to happier times. So I do this for them. It's my turn to be their light in the darkness. It's the least I can do, considering all they've done for me. Well. I had, uh, no idea. I mean, it's your thing, I guess. I go on the occasional tangential videos on Elvish philosophy and lifestyle, so I can't be too judgmental. So, you're not coming back then? Not right now. I'm happy here. Oh, Landon, there's an evil version of you in this universe. Really? No beard? Yeah, he kept me in a plastic case for a month. Uh, speaking of which, I owe somebody a favor for getting me out of that. He kept you in a plastic case for a month? What kind of monster would do a thing like that? Ah, I'm getting feedback. We can't keep the portal open much longer. The power drain is too great. If you don't jump through now, we may never get you back. It's okay, Puka. I know the way back. I can return if I really need to, but for now, I'm gonna stay in Dimension 788. Since you went through all the trouble to find me, I can at least say goodbye in the proper way. This is Brian Tulsa reminding everyone to please read books. Goodbye, old friend. That's it. We're losing power. The portal is closing. Take care. I hope your dolls bring you peace and happiness. In this internet climate, I'm a little jealous. It's good to see you, Empire. say things that were important rather than ha ha ha. And they're also actually really quite lovely to look at. There was a whole series uh, done in this sort of neo-noir Sam Spade style that looked fantastic. And a couple of videos Brian did back in the day that stick with me. Uh, one about Oklahoma, about his home state of Oklahoma, and what it meant and means to him. And the, you know, the, the clear love and affection he has for the state, but without rose-tinted glasses, seeing it for what it is, and I think perhaps a, a wish that more Oklahomans would know more of their own history. The other one, and particularly, I, I thought of it a lot during the whole Bernie Hillary primary, was a video he did called something like a liberal and not a progressive, uh, in American terms, putting why he was a liberal but not a progressive. It's a video I've thought about a lot over the years. So, well, I'd love to see Brian or Byron back, but I'd love to see maybe some of those neo-noir videos done for G.I. Joe. You never know. Anyway, 
See you around. This gives me hope for Oklahoma. My daughters are smart, and they will be taught to be curious, tolerant, and courageous. If they can become leaders, then Oklahoma's future is promising. Hello, everyone. You may not know me, and I may not know you, but we both know one person in particular. Hooded Cobra Commander 788. I know him as Brian. Brian Tulsa. All my memories of Brian's channel are overwhelmingly positive. He always approached even the most contentious issue with a sober, judge-like mindset. All his videos were very rational, well thought out, well reasoned, well evident. He was a pillar of the small community which we inhabited. Occasionally his stoicism was on the irritating side because you just want to be snide and catty and engage in angry one-upmanship and he put together very well thought out arguments as to why that's not a very good idea. He was always right. When it came to politics and the law, he was what we all needed, a thinker. It is with great sadness that I can no longer anticipate more videos from Brian Tulsa. So be thankful for what you've got. Our loss is your game. I remember Brian with his hat, sitting there in his living room, actually teaching me shit. He was actually pretty good at that. He was one of the skeptical human beings whose videos I really loved to watch in the old days. And we interacted a few times on YouTube back in the day where there was sort of a skeptic or whatever you would call it community. It's good to see you again, Brian. Peace and don't panic. So he's got a YouTube channel where now he just plays with dogs. Brian was one of the most level-headed members of the YouTube skeptical community to the point that he would irritate me when I would get emotional about an issue and he would stick purely with legality. He always had my back when I needed a fact about the law double checked to ensure that I'm not going to misrepresent something I think is true and look like an idiot. Thanks, Brian. I hope that clears a few things up. Thanks for watching.